about a lengthy passage found in Acts chapter 2 and beginning there at verse 1. This is the Word of God. This is not just the opinion or the doctrine of Pentecostals. This is the Word of God. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire and sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born? Parthians, Medes, Eliamites, those who dwell in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Persia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya adjoining Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them speaking in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what could this mean? And others, mocking, said, they are full of new wine. Today, we joyfully return to the topic that we have called explaining Pentecost. I find it necessary and important, but I don't believe that I'm alone in that. Whenever they were perplexed and confused and even some mocked, immediately Peter stood in the midst and began to explain the events of Pentecost. Far too long we have enjoyed our own antics, if you will, inside the Pentecost and Pentecostal movement and have spent no time explaining to the onlooking world of the unsaved and other churches what is actually taking place. It's time that we explain these events in a way that people can understand. I believe that this explanation matters because there is a lot of confusion that surrounds Pentecost, and the Word of God says that God is not the author of confusion. So since he is not, surely Satan must be, and he has chosen to use the gifts the visible and manifest gifts of the Holy Spirit to confuse not simply the world, but also the body of Christ. When people are confused, it's paralyzing. When people are confused, rather than do something differently, they often do nothing at all. And I believe there's a lot of paralysis that has gripped the body of Christ. This explanation matters because this remarkable event launched the church age brought extraordinary power to the disciples, and also it brought such change to their world that these changes were recorded in the book of Acts for all to see and to read about. So we care about that kind of change that was wrought in that day, even in our own day, and so we read and we study and try to understand. It also matters because this outpouring, this very outpouring about which Jesus promised and foretold his disciples would come to them was to enable them to go and to make disciples. It was to enable them to go and begin. This was the beginning of the church age and it was the beginning of global evangelization. And he told them to go into the world and to evangelize the world with the gospel of the good news. Now, the reason that it matters that we would explain these things, because that assignment, that task, is not yet complete. Therefore, the sustaining work of the Holy Spirit is still needed in our time and in our age. I believe this particular text makes it plain in Acts chapter 1 when he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses, and all the way to the end of that chapter, he said, to the end of the earth. So in spite of the assertions of the cessationist, the belief that the charismatic spiritual gifts, and by that I mean speaking in tongues, the word of knowledge, word of wisdom, interpretation of tongues, and so on, the idea that these ended with the death of the apostles or the closing canon of scriptures, the lessons, I believe, of church history provide evidence 
that every great revival was birthed because of periodic outpourings of the Spirit, just like the kind that occur occurred that day at Pentecost. So today I'm going to be a little bit professor-like, and this is going to become a classroom in the early part of the sermon as we take a historic look, not at the church of God, we will do that, but specifically at the history of the church itself. The church, you know, has a history. And so there's an interesting thing that happens in the time of history, and that is people who are living in those particular times go to the trouble to write things down. It may not be a specific quest, to record the events, to pass them along. They may just write them down. How many of you write things down from time to time in your legal pads, not really being full, fully aware that you're actually recording your own life and times and 100 or 500 years from now, someone could dig through the debris and the things that you write and the journals that you keep and the letters that you send to your loved ones, those could be collected and actually preserved somewhere in a museum and it would be a historical record of this age and this generation. We sometimes take those things for granted. Honestly, I'm a little concerned about how history is being recorded now because with just the push of a button, you can delete a lot of history on our computers. And we now don't have paper copies and hard copies. And I'm concerned about how well we might be preserving what's taking place now. But in those days, those who could write and those who had those special gifts and very few people could, they made it their business to write things down. And as a result, there is an incredibly elaborate and well-documented history of the church and that's stored away in many of the vaults across this globe I'm going to to go back immediately after the days of Pentecost to some of the earliest records that would document for us uh, any outpourings of the Holy Spirit which might have occurred in whatever form or manifestation they might have taken that really matters because cessationists among other things they will say to you that the the outpouring on Pentecost did actually occur but it really came to an end whenever uh, John closed the book of uh, writing the book of Revelation and whenever the last apostle John the beloved died then it all came to an end and you actually did not see anything at all until finally about a little over a hundred years ago and then there was this suddenly this Johnny come lately explosion and now it swept across the world and so they simply want to dismiss that and I would say that they would actually have a right if that was true but there's an interesting thing when some people examine history actually any intelligent psychologist would say that whenever you talk to any individual to hire them or to get to know their value or their ability to contribute to culture and society you want to know what are their strengths what are their weaknesses but it doesn't end with knowing your strengths and your weaknesses we also want to know your biases because an individual's bias keeps him from seeing certain things Linda sends me to get the salt shaker and she tells me where it's at but I know perfectly well it's not there because I had it last and I left it somewhere else so I go where she tells me to find it, but I cannot see it because I don't believe it's there. Have you ever looked for something? And I, and I would say, honey, it's not there. And she'll come and reach right over my shoulder and get it right off the shelf because it was in plain view. But I had a bias that it was not there because I knew that I had left it someplace else. When you look at historical record with a bias towards cessationism, then you are prone to rewrite history and write that off as heretical or even as some sort of an early cult or some sort of a false religion or false prophecy simply because you have already decided, you understand what I'm saying, when you arrive and do your research with a bias already in mind, you are immediately blinded. So I, I want you to understand that it is not my quest to put an end to the doctrine, I would call it the scriptureless doctrine of cessationism. I know that I'm not the guy to do that. It's not even my quest to try to change the minds of people who believe that. In spite of the fact that John MacArthur is quick to write me off as a nut and a heretic, I actually love him, and, and I could go to heaven with him, but he would be shocked to look around and see me there because he believes that I'm a nut and a heretic and that I'm believing in a strange fire and an ungodly doctrine. He believes that because of his bias, and I'll never change that, but what I need to do is to present some truth and ask you to look at history with an open mind and see what those people in their own day were writing down that was preserved and now handed down to you and I and see if it speaks to you in any way. Can you do that with me? 
If you can honestly do that, then I think that you will learn some things that would mean something in the year 100 AD. Now, this would have been about a decade or so uh, after the death of John the Beloved. Bishop Clements wrote a letter to the Corinthians, uh, written, he was the Bishop of Rome, and he refers to the continuing supernatural work of the Holy Spirit and writes, and I quote, an abundant outpouring also of the Holy Spirit fell upon all, end quote. Now, I don't know what caused him to believe there was an abundant outpouring of the Holy Spirit, but with that close proximity to the outpouring of Pentecost, there must have been some similar evidence that persuaded this man to write just that single brief sentence. In the year 115 to 202, there was a man, uh, a bishop of Lyon named Arrhenius. He was a student of Polycarp who was a disciple of John the Beloved, and Arrhenius wrote a, 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 a booklet or a, a, a collection of ideas called A Treatise Against Heresies in AD 185 that recorded many manifestations of the operation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit of which I will only share one but it is somewhat lengthy. Quote, he said, some drive out demons really and truly so that often those cleansed from evil spirits believe and become members of the church. Some have foreknowledge of the future, visions and prophetic utterances. Others, by the laying on of hands, heal the sick and restore them to health. And before, as I said, dead men have actually been raised and have remained with us many years. In fact, it is impossible to enumerate the gifts which throughout the worldwide church has received from God in the name of Jesus Christ, crucified under Pontius Pilate and every day puts to effectual use for the benefit of the heathen, deceiving no one and making profit of no one. Similarly, we hear of many members of the church who have prophetic gifts and by the Spirit speak with all kinds of tongues and men's secret thoughts come to light through their own good expounded mysteries of God in like manner. We also hear many brethren in the church who possess prophetic gifts, who speak the Spirit in the Spirit, all kinds of languages and bring to light to the general benefit the hidden things of men and declare the mysteries of of God and I could go on. Interesting evidence just, just a few decades after the day of Pentecost. Moving forward to the years 160 AD to 225 AD, Tertullian, a prophetic theologian and Christian writer and a lawyer of rare genius ministering in Carthage. He described supernatural visions and prophetic gifts of the Holy Spirit as operating normally in the third century church. He says, and I quote, and thus, we who both acknowledge and reverence, even as we do prophecies, modern visions as equally promised to us and consider the other powers of the Holy Spirit as an agency of the church for which he also was sent administering all gifts in all, even as the Lord distributed to everyone, end quote. Moving forward to the Christian theologian Novation in Rome, who wrote about the key role of the Holy Spirit in the church. This would have been in the 300 and 400 year range. The church died. He died as a martyr during the last wave of persecution by the Roman emperors. Quote, he said, they... Believers were henceforth armed and strengthened by the same Spirit, having in themselves the gifts which this same Spirit distributes and appropriates to the church. The spouse of Christ as her ornaments. I like that, the gifts of the spirits as ornaments. This is he who places prophets in the church, instructs teachers, directs tongues, gives powers and healings, and does wonderful works, often dis uh, discrimination, and I inserted, I had to look up what he meant here by this word discrimination. Often discernment of spirits affords powers of governments, suggests counsels and orders, and arranges whatever other gifts there are of charismata, and thus make the Lord's church everywhere in all perfected and complete. So I think that you're actually getting the point. So I could, until everyone walked out, continue to read and quote Ambrose from 340 to 397, the missionary Vincent Ferrer, 1350 to 1491, Louis Bertrand, 1526 to 1851, and Jonathan Edwards, there will be a test on this later, from 1702 to 1758, and many, many others. In other words... 
There is a historical evidence that from time to time, at times of his own choosing, God has in extraordinary ways in the history of the Christian movement poured out his spirit in fresh, new, uncustomary, and dramatic ways. There have been times of revival and awakening and reformation. Pentecost was the first of these great outpourings and they will continue until the task of evangelism is completed. Now let me quote to you from Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards wrote about 250 years ago and some consider Jonathan Edwards to be the theologian of the Pentecostal movement. He is not a man without controversy. He is one, if you read, you will be, both be delighted at what he has to read and you will also, I believe as I was, be a little disappointed, not in him, but in fact that he gave the warning, son, that this whole business of placing an inappropriate focus on the manifested visible gifts of the Spirit were taking over the church and we were consequently losing the real power that accompanied it and he actually warned congregations 250 years ago do not allow yourself to be swept away in the emotional don't be swept away in the physical manifestations and the outward speaking of tongues and the outward dance and the shout and actually more than once he was preaching under the anointing and people would lose control and and drowned him out and he couldn't even preach a sermon and he became so concerned about it he wrote about it at length and it seems that the Pentecostal movement ignored it and went on our way with our physical manifestations while having appearance of a church but denying the power thereof and that's where we find ourselves today as a powerless church so let me read to you one quote by Jonathan Edwards and then I'll actually preach to you for about 12 minutes from the fall of man to our day, the work of redemption in its effect has mainly been carried on by the remarkable and extraordinary communications of the Spirit of God. Now I'm quoting him. Can I read that again? From the fall of man to our day, the work of redemption in its effect has mainly been carried on by the remarkable and extraordinary communications of the Spirit of God. There is a more constant influence of God's Spirit always in some degree attending his ordinance, yet the way in which the greatest things have been done towards carrying on this work have always been by remarkable effusions, that's an old archaic word that means outpourings, at special seasons of mercy. And so he himself is affirming this historical reoccurring about every 100 year pattern in the timing of God, of outpourings of the Holy Spirit. So I come to this task this morning with not just a mere academic interest. I told Brother Will last night, I'm always the student. I do not consider myself to be an expert. I'm always a learner. And I, and I, I pray that I'll always maintain that hunger to learn and to know. So I don't present myself as some sort of expert, nor do I come to this task with mere uh, academic curiosity uh, of, of some uh, seemingly unrepeatable event that took place on the day of Pentecost, as MacArthur would assert, I come with this simple persuasion that we have much to gain in our day of widespread deadness and powerless in our churches because of our spiritless and lack of interaction with the Holy Spirit. I think we have a lot to gain by asking what took place and what value does it hold to us in our generation as the end time church. Okay, so now a set up for my concluding much more scriptural remarks. That's the history. One of Satan's best skills has always been his ability to misrepresent the word of God and to redirect us from its truth. So even if we as Pentecostals believe in the events of Pentecost and the power that accompanied it, but allow our focus to be misdirected, then we will not lay hold of the power in any real way. So how is it possible that we might have done that? Throughout 
all of the world today in the Pentecostal movement, the emphasis is on tongue speaking. It is when we talk about it. We want to warn our friends when we invite them to church. Now we want you to know we are a Pentecostal church. That's our way of saying it could get a little scary. <laughs> there could be somebody speaking in tongues. There could be some strange stuff. I want you to know that right from the beginning, whenever the apostle Peter stood to make the explanation, the first thing that he did was try to put at ease the people who were perplexed and concerned about what they had saw. The first thing out of his mouth was a warning to Pentecostals. What you do is going to appear to be strange. Be careful in what you do. The apostle Paul went further and said, if you constantly stay on this track, they are going to think you are mad. So immediately there was a warning. Now look, you know who's talking to you. I, can, I believe at this point, like the Apostle Paul in uh, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, when he is handing out the warnings and saying, still I want you to desire spiritual gifts and that you may prophesy. He's handing out the warnings and, and saying, being careful in how you manifest this and you're letting things get out of control. And he said, look, don't forbid people to speak in tongues. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than you all. You know that I'm a tongue speaker. You know that I believe in the power of the Holy Spirit. You know that I believe in the utterance and the gift of tongues but we've allowed that to become the emphasis when it was never meant to be the emphasis. Don't you think that our Lord could have said in Acts chapter 1, go into the upper room and tarry until you are filled with the Holy Spirit, with the ability to speak in another language, and, and you're going to love this. Instead, he said, go and tarry until you are endued with power for witnessing. It was from the beginning, it was about evangelism, and we've made it about tongue talking. Satan has effectively led us down an improper path, and we feel like we, listen, I'm, I'm telling you the truth. We had over 200 people saved at Manowar Church last year, and I'm asked every other week, Pastor, when are we going to have a revival? Because we think a revival is somebody that's got a suitcase and some tongue talking, and we don't recognize that when you've got 200 people being saved in a year, you've got revival so I'm not mad I'm just passionate it makes me mad when the devil is able to redirect our thinking and cause us see he said what did he say to Eve in the garden did God really say that he couldn't have meant that you mean he made all of this and said that you can't even eat that really yeah and not only that he said if we eat it we'll die that's not true. If you eat it, you'll live. You'll be wise. You'll be like God's. Incredible. God missed the whole thing. Did God actually say he would pour out a spirit so that we would be bold and able to invite people to church and able to go into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in? But not us. We have no church activity beyond the walls. We just come in here and have a good time and let the world go to hell. I just wonder what we really got. I just wonder what we really got. So it's critical that we understand. See, I think it's tragic that all of Pentecost, including the church of God, places all the emphasis on glossolalia and tongue speaking. And we place so much emphasis on it, we actually say, listen, since over half of our churches no longer publicly speak in tongues, over half of our churches are no longer Pentecostal, that's not the right way to judge. It's not. It's easy to judge it that way. We can carnally judge it that way. So in order to make sure that we are not labeled as a non-tongue speaking church, thank God or the God of darkness that somebody will just make up a tongue every now and then and that way we can say, bless God, at least we're Pentecostal. No, we are not. Then we are actually dabbling in strange fire. Amen. Sometimes I won't get a lot of help. I would get more amens from MacArthur right now than I would you. <laughs> he said in Acts chapter 1 verse 8, but you shall receive power. 
Thank God for power. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, power for what? You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. I've got two points to make and I will be furnished. The first point that I want you to see, which emphasizes the purpose for the power of the Holy Ghost. Listen, I'm telling you, when you get it, when you understand, when you get full of the Holy Spirit, that will enable you to win your brother-in-law. That will enable you to win your children and your grandchildren. It will actually give you the power and the effect and the ability to choose the right language and know when to remain silent. He will actually direct you in moments like that so you'll be effective in soul winnings. The modern church is not effective in soul winning. The average church in America, once it is 10 years old, will win one new convert for each 80 members per year. A church of 250 can expect three new converts in a 12-month period. That is a congregation void of the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll be honest, I don't care whose name is over the door. If it says Church of God and you're not winning more than one per 80, you don't have the Holy Ghost. You got the shoulders shake, but you missed the real deal. So first of all, when the fullness of time, when the Holy Spirit fell, it fell at a time of pilgrimage. There were three great holidays in the Jewish nation of Israel. Three times whenever they journeyed to the capital city. Three times they saved up their money to take a vacation and to bring sacrificial offerings to the city. That was a time that literally the word of God said in the passage that I read to you. They were there from, under every, from every nation under the heaven. Every nation on earth was represented. So God chose to release the Holy Spirit at that time when the city would be bustling with visitors. In one day, it wasn't just simply that he built a church of a thousand in one day. It wasn't just that on that day, evangelism worked and three people were swept out of hell into heaven. And it wasn't just that, but it is that literally they were from every nation under the heavens. So God chose that day because there's going to be an incredible crowd in town. God chose that day because they were going to represent every tongue-speaking language there must have been about 120 different languages being spoken there that day because I got a feeling if there'd been 121, there'd been 121 in the upper room. I just don't think God would miscount at an important time like that. I'm just speculating, but I feel like that if you were within earshot, there was somebody declaring the glories of God in your language. It was, it was a revival outpouring. He said that they were there. So, so first of all, the timing was divine because God knew that the city would be pressed in to capacity with men and women who had come for religious purposes, come seeking God, and he had this entire, it was a perfect opportunity of revival. Just speaking to the genius of God, how God always has to plan ahead. Somebody gave me a testimony this morning in my office of, of a battle they had been enduring for a year on the job, for a year on the job, doing the work of two people, unable to bear the load any longer. He loves his job and loves what he was doing and, 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 and had fulfillment from his job every day. But somebody had quit or left over a year ago and they hadn't replaced that. And suddenly he's doing the work of two men, showing up every day bearing the load of two men. And only last week, in the middle of our praying and fasting, he said, I was out, in the warehouse floor, overwhelmed and exhausted. And I said, God, I need you to intervene. I cannot go any longer. I need you to step in or I'm going to have to quit this job. And I like this job. You're going to have to step in. That was Tuesday. Thursday, they hired him a coworker. Known only in the heavenlies, God had already been working on it, knowing that eventually he'd get around to asking. And I told him in the office, if he hadn't asked, he still wouldn't have no help. That guy would still be winding down, putting in a four-month notice on his old job. But as soon as he asked, God showed up and sent the answer. In the beautiful, incredible timing of God, the crucifixion of Jesus, 
the timing of the trials. All of that was perfectly timed so that he would be able to spend the 40 days and be seen by multitudes after his resurrection. And it was all just perfect. Jesus knew the timing of God when he stood there about to ascend into the heavens and he said, you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days hence. Jesus knew the clock of the Heavenly Father was already running and he had, had been crucified right on time. He had been resurrected right on time. He was ascending right on time and just in a few days just in time for all of these visitors to be in town just at the feast of Pentecost there will be this outpouring of the Holy Spirit I'm just saying God is a genius the second thing that I want you to know is that the outpouring of Pentecost is in every way entirely about the harvest Pentecost took place 50 days after Passover. It was called in Exodus 23, 16, the feast of the harvest, the feast of the harvest. Do you see the beautiful connection between the celebration of the harvest in the Old Testament and the timely arrival of the Holy Spirit had come to enable the disciples to do what? To reap the harvest of souls after Calvary. And now the blood of Jesus shed for all of mankind. Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse two, the harvest truly is great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And that's exactly what happened on the day of Pentecost. They began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And as they spoke in other tongues, thousands of people who spoke hundreds of languages were able to hear the, 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 the gospel message in their own language and in their own dialect and there was this incredible celebration of souls, but not just a harvest of souls, but also the beginning of the new church. And I'm gonna close with this, if someone will come. I wanna close with this part of it. Whenever Peter saw everything that was taking place, their mannerisms, they staggered like they were drunk. The power and the passion with which they spoke they lifted up their voices. There were no PA systems. Nobody's whispering. They come out of the upper room with incredible boldness. You understand that they were behind closed doors hiding so that they wouldn't be killed by the same people that crucified Jesus. They were afraid. They kept doors locked. Jesus had to appear through locked doors and step through a wall. Fear had gripped the heart of the people. The disciples had run and hid. Now the Holy Ghost falls and they're filled with boldness. They fling open the doors and stagger out into the street looking for a group of people that they can begin to declare. And when they open their mouth, instead of speaking in a language they had learned, they spoke in the language of the listeners. It was incredible. It was incredible what was taking place. And so suddenly the gospel is being spread. And here's the interesting thing because whenever we get together, we will all have, we'll always have these kinds of crowds. We'll have people who are amazed and say, wow, this, is, this, this has got to be of God. We'll have people who are perplexed. They're curious. They just don't really get it. They don't understand it. And then we will have people who mock and make fun and say, they're all drunk. They're full of some new kind of wine. Where can I buy that kind of wine? And I, I want to say this because as Pentecostals, we need to lay hold of this, not just here inside the sanctuary. Instead of admitting and agreeing to your family members and that your coworkers that we're all crazy and that we're all nuts, you need to tell them that nobody barks like dogs here. And nobody laughs like, laughs like hyena, hyenas here. There is no foolishness that takes place here. This is a place where God dwells. And go ahead. I've heard my son sometimes describe us as Pentecostals with our seat belts on. It's a shame to have to say that because it means that a lot of people have cast off wisdom and cast off restraint and cast off order and cast off wisdom. And you need to tell them whenever you sit across from your coworker and say, how are things? And he begins to describe the mess at home or begins to tell you how he just lost his father and he's having a hard time dealing with it. 
And, and I'm, I'm telling you, if you live in the same world I do, if you'll actually sit down with anybody and ask questions, I don't care where you are, you can just simply say, well, how are things with you? If people sense that you care, they'll begin to tell you what a mess their life is. And sometimes can you, ask, you ask, do you go to church? And they'll say, yes, but it just seems like church has nothing to offer. It was never meant for church to be a place with nothing to offer. The world is, is, is surrounded with people who don't have answers and people who don't have solutions to their problems and to their troubles. We were meant to be a place where the Spirit of God dwells and meets people at their most desperate need. And so the Apostle Peter, seeing the perplexity, witnessing the genuine confusion, I often think how many times you visitors come and say, you know, I've, never, I've just never seen it like that. I've never seen the choir sing with such exuberance. I, I've just never seen a preacher preaches till he gets hoarse. I, I've never been around it like that. And so we don't stop often enough and say, well, let me explain. Let me tell you the urgency that I feel. Why I can't just talk this out without emotion because I just feel it all the way down inside me. So Peter stood up that day. It was so significant that he stood up because he was the very one that ran, denied the Lord and said, I don't know him. He cursed and said, I don't know the man. Three years with Jesus, but afraid, afraid. He ran and hid. But now, touched by the promise of the Holy Spirit, he stood and said, men and brethren, men and brethren, he said, to those of you who don't know who Jehovah God is, all you Romans, all you pagan worshipers, all of you on the outside, men and brethren, those of you that have been following after Jehovah, but don't know what's just happened, let me talk to you. These men are not drunk. It's not what you think. My God, I believe it's our responsibility as Pentecostals, first of all, to straighten up. And second, say to our lost friends, it's not what you think. I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's not right to ask someone to control their emotions. When someone's heart is broken, it's not right to say, don't cry. Whenever someone is carrying a burden that no human should have to bear, and they come to the altar and Jesus lifts it, it's not right for us to say, don't rejoice. There's a place and a time for rejoicing. Don't you get that? There's a time. Whenever I was a little boy, there was a man who had been crippled all of his life in Vanceburg, Kentucky. We knew him. And one day he came to church and they prayed for him and God healed him. His legs wouldn't straighten out. And they just prayed for him and God healed him. After that, every time everybody else came to the altar to pray, he came to the altar like this. <laughs> he would just do this the whole time. And so finally, some guests like you showed up and there he was. And after church, one of the guests came to my dad and said, I just tell you, let everything be done decently and in order. And somebody needs to tell that man to sit down. And my dad said, well, he used to be crippled. All of his life, he couldn't walk. He was bound in a wheelchair. And the saints prayed for him and anointed him with oil. And God healed his legs. You tell him to sit down. There's a time to rejoice, but there's also a time for us to just stop for a minute and explain what's going on. Last week, Andre Crouch passed away. I loved him and I loved his music and all of you young people, you just have to go see it on YouTube. I went on the internet when I heard and, and I just typed in Andre Kraut's songs. And the list just floated down, and to my surprise, I knew them all. 
Linda and I went to see him in concert at Asbury in about 1975, 76. The auditorium was packed to absolute capacity. He had become famous just quickly. God undergirded his fame. And uh, his plane was late. We were there and it was time and, and the, the stage was empty. They hadn't even come and set up musical instruments. And finally, about 15 or 20 minutes after, someone came and said, ladies and gentlemen, we have just heard from Mr. Crouch and he is in Atlanta. His flight has been delayed. And he said, he will not be here for three hours. But he said, if you will stay, he'll come and we'll still have church. And so we stayed and visited and they sold more refreshments that they had planned on. <laughs> and uh, about three hours later, the band members came out and they began setting up. And after they did their sound checks and everything, about 10 o'clock that night, this beautiful black man walked out on stage with a bit of a beard, dressed like he was from California. You know, I don't, I, you know, I'm always, I always keep arm's length from California Christians, you know? <laughs> I mean, he just dressed, he was so different from anybody I knew, you know? Had a big gold chain. I'm still, I'm still infant Pentecostal. We don't wear gold chains, you know? But in his very soft, breathy voice, he leaned into the mic and he said, I like that. Ask the ushers to just close the doors. We're going to be here a while because we're going to have church. He said, God gave me a song. I haven't sung it anywhere yet. I believe it's a, it's a word for you. He turned and went to the piano and sat down and leaned into the mic and he said, it won't be long. Then we'll be leaving here. It won't be long. We'll be going home. And then he said, so count the years as months. Count the months as weeks. Count the weeks as days. Any day now, we'll be going home. It was just about that quiet, just two notes on the piano, just here and there. By the time he had sang that, the very spirit that they say is no longer operating had filled that house so thick and so undeniable that he couldn't hardly go on and we couldn't hardly go on. I just want you to know that he is real. In spite of the confusion, we live in the age of the Holy Spirit. We live in that age. So, so, so what, here's what that means, saints. Here's what that means. If you have lost loved ones, if you will pray, two things will happen. The Holy Spirit will begin to speak to their heart. You say, well, I've tried before to win my family. I get that. But when we're just doing that on our own, we mostly are obnoxious and we offend. But when we pray, he prepares their heart and he directs you. So even though you may be afraid to be a witness, suddenly you'll be able to stand up like Peter did on the day of Pentecost. And suddenly people will come to Jesus. If you have brokenness in your home and in your family, and in your marriage and among your children, you're facing things that seem insurmountable. This is, this is his time. That member of the Godhead is active in us and in our church in this age. That's why there will be the great harvest. That's why that we will overcome. That's why we will emerge victorious, even in a godless culture. Would you stand in a godless culture in a sea of sin?